Debt Free TV in association with getoutofdebtfree.org. Great, lovely to speak to you all today. Thank you for coming. You've obviously seen on the television the discovery, or so-called discovery, at, uh, in Switzerland at the particle accelerator of the Higgs boson. And there was a lot of excitement, but the reality is there is no Higgs boson. When those physicists have spent eight billion dollars or eight billion euros on a piece of equipment to discover something they're going to discover it and what they've done is they've actually interpreted the data to prove what they want rather than what is so I've got a completely different alternative view of the universe and I've written it up in this this book, The Vortex of Energy. And thousands of years ago in India, the yogis used their city powers to probe the atom, to look into the atom, to see what was in the atom. And what they saw is that the atom has a lot in common with Tony Blair. There's nothing in there but spin. So, what the yogis saw was that spin creates mass, not Higgs boson. They didn't see Higgs boson in, in the uh, atom, they saw spin. So, what is spinning? Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give you a little quote from the Bible. It's the first verse of St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Alright? Now, Word is sound, sound is vibration, vibration is energy. And so, you can retranslate that first verse of the Bible into, in the beginning was the energy, and the energy was with God, and the energy was God. So, you have in that first verse of St. John's Gospel a definition of God, that God is energy. Now I'm a scientist and no scientist will have a problem with that definition because energy is neither created nor destroyed, God's neither created nor destroyed. Energy is everywhere, God is everywhere. Energy is in everything, God is in everything. Okay? Nothing is that is not energy, nothing is that is not God. And so the question is, how do we form this universe out of energy, or if you like, God stuff? The thing about physics is you've got to define your terms. And unless you define your terms, you don't know what you're talking about. And the thing is that there are two words which are very undefined. One word is energy. Richard Feynman said, in physics today we have no any idea what energy is. And the other word is God. You know, lots of people have different ideas of what that word means. So the beauty of that first verse of St. John is we get a real definition of both energy and God. That you're talking about word, you're talking about sound, you're talking about vibration, you're talking about light, you're talking about frequency. It's like this, they're saying that everything is frequency. Everything is vibration. But that's just one form of energy, which is frequency, vibration, the waveform. The other form of energy which the yogis saw was spin, the vortex. And so what I'm, I've realized that there are two forms of energy. One form is the waveform and the other form is the vortex. And what this is, this is the ball of wool, and the ball of wool is a perfect model for the vortex. It's a subatomic whirlpool 
of light. And so it allows energy to stand still. It creates a form of energy that spreads in three dimensions. So this explains the three dimensional extension of matter. Okay, mass is created by spin, the stay put inertia of matter. It's like there's a gyroscope in here, but the gyroscope is in every direction. So it, this spin of the gyroscope resists movement in any direction. So this inertia, this resistance to movement comes from spin. So we can explain all the properties of matter in terms of spin. So <clears throat> What we've got is we've got two forms of energy. One is the waveform, which is frequency and vibration. The other is the vortex form, which is mass. And if you go back to John's verse, and we go back to this word, word, the thing about word is that you can have the spoken word which transmits information, which is like the waveform, and you can have the written word, which is a memory, it's a store of the information, which is the vortex form. So that's the beauty of John's definition, he actually is describing the two forms of energy. There's the memory, and then there's the transmission of information. There's the spoken word, and there's the written word. And the thing about St. John is he was a mystic. And the thing about those yogic philosophies in India is that they were mystics. And Paul Rowland says, you know, mysticism is the origin of true science. You see. So it's bringing together mysticism and science. science. This, is what we're, this is what we're endeavoring to achieve. And it's just so, so simple. We don't need particle accelerators. I mean, billions are spent on these particle accelerators when the yogis did it for nothing, just using their mystic powers. And discovered exactly how the universe is formed. So, the question is, where does this energy finish? Just take that away. Where does the energy finish? How big is the vortex? Well, if you imagine this is like a balloon and you keep blowing it up so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the rubber never disappears, it just gets thinner. So imagine you have this magic balloon which just never bursts. It would just get larger and larger and larger. And this is what the vortex of energy is, it just extends into infinity. So every vortex it's as big as the universe. Every electron is as big as the universe. So mass, matter, is the dense center of the vortex that we perceive. Space is the extension of the vortex into infinity. So now we understand what space is. So the vortex explains mass, it explains inertia, it explains extension into three dimensions. The vortex explains this corpuscular shape of the subatomic particles in the atom, the electrons, the protons, the neutrons, because it's the subatomic particles we're talking about. Okay? And now we also understand space. When Einstein went to New York in 1919, just after he'd been proclaimed the most celebrated scientist in the world, someone asked him, a reporter asked him, Albert Einstein, can you put your theory of relativity in a single sentence? And Einstein said, yes, if you remove matter, you also remove space and time. So when you move matter, you move space and time. So he's inferring there's a, a, a connection between matter and space and time. And we've got it, the, the vortex is, a, is matter, it is space, it is time, and because all vortices overlap with all other vortices and vortices are dynamic when they overlap they interact and this explains action at a distance electric charge and magnetism so this one model is explaining everything in physics it's incredibly simple
What explains the expansion rate? Sorry? What, what's causing the expansion? Well, what it is, is this, that it's a bit like the water cycle. The, the energy, the water evaporates off the ocean, forms the clouds, falls as rain, runs underground to form a spring, out of the spring, into the stream, into the river, into the ocean. It's a cycle. And what happens with the vortex is the energy spins out <coughs> or it spins in and the spin out is a positive charge and the spin in is a negative charge. So the energy spins in in a negative charge and disappears at the center of the electron which is what which is a point of singularity it's a zero space point the smallest space and it's like Alice in Wonderland you know she drank the drink me drink and she shrank and disappeared into the looking glass world well the vortex the energy inside the vortex disappears through the center and comes out the other side and spins out the other side to form a positively charged electron, a positron, a particle of antimatter. <coughs> so what it is, is that beyond every particle of matter, there's a particle of antimatter. There's, there's an antimatter version of me in an antimatter world, in an antimatter universe, inside me and gone out the other side in a looking glass world. But whenever I move, my antimatter half moves with me. But because it's a vortex, there's, an, there's a force of attraction between my matter and your antimatter. You see? But, and you really feel this force of attraction between y the matter of your body and the antimatter of the earth. She's standing on the earth, but there's a pull from the antimatter. And that's called gravity. So now we've explained gravity, we've included gravity in the. In, yeah? So I get that before, is that my antimatter pulling their antimatter towards me? You know, when you're walking towards someone and you actually keep start going that way a little bit. <laughs> it's a bit like that. Well, in actual fact, it's interesting that because you can feel them in your space, their vibration, their frequency. You don't like their, you know, their, their space is merging with your space and you don't like the frequency in their space. Makes you feel uncomfortable. And so you, you, you move away. Yeah, you're feeling their vibrations. It's all, we're all, we're, none of us are islands. We're all linked and interconnected through, through our space overlapping. You see. And the thing is that if you take a positive charge where the energy is expanding out, well, all my vortex energy and all the particles of my body is expanding out, and then it joins up with yours, and then it joins up with the positive charges of the Earth, and then the solar system, and then the galaxy, and then the super galaxy, and it goes on and on and on until all the vortex energy from all the positive charges in, the, in our universe of matter get to a maximum sphere of space and what then well it goes in because beyond the maximum space out there if you go out and out and out where does the universe end it ends in the largest sphere of space for matter which is also the largest sphere of space for antimatter and then it disappears and it spins in and in and in and in and in until it forms the anti protons in your body in antimatter and it goes shooting through the center and then comes out as, as matter so it's like negatively charged protons and then through the center into the positively charged protons in your body so this is perfect symmetry now between matter and antimatter there's a force of attraction therefore the further the galaxies are away from us the faster they should be accelerating from us because of the pull between the galaxies of antimatter and the galaxies of matter and therefore, the universe, the expansion, the universe expansion sh should be accelerating. And I predicted that in 1995 in a book that was published in London. And so it's a, a written, published publication of that prediction. And in 1998, it was discovered. It, the, the, 
the results of 10 years study of supernova explosions in distant galaxies was published to reveal that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So I made the prediction in 1995 and it was proved in 1998. So according to the scientific method, the scientific method says the theory is true if you can do two things. One is you have to explain the most things with the minimum assumptions. In other words, it's got to be simple and self-evident. Well, the vortex theory is incredibly simple and self-evident. We're just explaining everything. And the second thing is you've got to predict the, out the outcome of future experiments. Well, I've managed to predict the accelerating expansion of the universe before it was discovered, before the discovery was published. So the thing is that this is a valid physics, it's not a Mickey Mouse physics. It's as valid as any other physics. And it's our physics, it belongs, you know, here we are at Boomtown, and this is our own physics. We've got our own Boomtown physics, if you see what I mean. This is the physics of the Festi scene, the physics of the hippies, the physics of the mystics, the physics of the New Age people, the physics of the alternative mob. We've got our own physics, and it's a good physics, it's a solid physics. Yeah? Can I, are you going to talk all about the mystical? About? The mystical. Yeah, I'm going to go on to that right away. But I would like to just say one thing about Higgs boson. How do we explain what they're doing in the particle accelerator? Well, at CERN they've built an 8 billion euro or dollar donut making machine. Actually, this ball of wool looks more like a donut than a ball of wool, which is perfect for this model. What they do is they shoot the energy through the vortex and the energy takes on the shape of the vortex and then comes out the other side as a vortex, but it doesn't last long. The thing about all these particles that they're discovering in the accelerators is they're incredibly short-lived because they're just transitional vortices. It's like if you push batter through a donut making machine, you get the shape of the donut, but it doesn't last unless you drop it into oil. Well, imagine if you just drop it on the floor, it goes into a mess of batter again. So it's exactly the same. You're pushing the energy through the vortex and you get the vortex shape. And then they interpret those transitional vortices and call them all sorts of things like quarks. They've got a quark theory, which means nonsense. And, and so, the thing is that we've got an alternative theory which, which basically challenges the, the existing theory. And it's much simpler, it's much more elegant. And basically, I've more or less covered the whole physics now. And how many people here have PhDs in physics? You do? Great, we've got one PhD in physics. I bet that doesn't happen very often. No, that doesn't happen. No, that's a first. That's a first. <laughs> I've been caught out here. Well, all right, you're qualified. Everyone else should leave. Only he should be here on this talk. No, the thing is, most people don't come up with PhDs in physics. I mean, most people haven't even got GCEs, GCSEs in physics. And the great thing is anyone can understand this. And that, that's, that's really what... Uh, what in, his, in his book, The Brief History of Time, Richard Dawkins was saying that if ever we do find a complete theory, it shouldn't be understandable by everyone, not just a few scientists and technicians. Um, because then we've, you know, we've all got a right to understand who we are, where we come from, and you know, the meaning of our lives. And so that's where I want to go to. He said that for them we, w we would know the mind of God. Well, I just want to sort of deal with that last statement, the mind of God, because God doesn't have a mind. The idea that there's a God with a mind is no different from the idea of an atom that moves. You know, God creates, the atom moves. In other words, something exists and acts. Both those ideas are materialism. The, the idea of materialism is you assume the existence of something which then acts or moves. It doesn't matter what you call that something, whether you call it an atom or a god. Those are just words. It's the underlying concept of materialism that's wrong. And Einstein challenged that idea because he said the sole universal constant is the speed of light. He said mass, space and time are relative to the speed of light. You see? In other words, the speed exists and there's nothing speeding. We've explained it away with the vortex. And back to John the Divine, he said God is the Word. And what is Word? It's pure energy. 
What is energy? That's the key thing. Richard Feynman said it's important to understand in physics today we have no idea what energy is. We've got to nail energy, pin energy down. Energy is p pure movement. Particles of movement, not particles that move. That's what our universe is made of. You see? And the thing is, the speed of those particles happens to be in our world the speed of light. That's why the speed of light is the constant in our world. So, what are these particles? If you've got movement where nothing exists that moves, it's more abstract than concrete reality. It's more, particles of energy are more like thoughts than things. So, it's not that the universe is the mind of God. God is the mind that the universe is. Do you get the thing? The universe is a mind. Because a body of thought is a mind. And the universe is a body of thought, it's a body of energy. If we say energy is mind, energy is thought, then the universe as a body of thought <coughs> is a mind. And so that mind that we call universe is God. So the, the bedrock of reality, the bedrock of reality is not a material substance or the or God, or anything, the bedrock of reality is consciousness. And this is where quantum physics is today. The leading quantum physicists recognize that the bedrock of reality is consciousness. And it comes from the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum reality that things only exist to the extent that they're observed. So underlying every particle is an observer. But whereas the particles are all many, there, there are countless particles of energy, the consciousness underlying them all is one. It, consciousness is one and it's indivisible. So the thing is that I'm conscious and you're conscious, but the consciousness behind my eyes, behind my ears, the consciousness that's seeing you, that's hearing the same sounds that you're hearing through your ears is one. We're all the one being in the many bodies. We're the one consciousness. This idea of being separate is a complete illusion. I mean, <coughs> I am the universal consciousness in a male body called David Ash, okay? Father of nine children and grandfather of ten. More wives and children than common sense. Now you are... No, yeah, I'll have a drink. You are that same consciousness in a female body okay and you're having a different experience to me it's diff you know men are from Mars women are from Venus it's different being a woman so it's a chance for consciousness to have a different different experience okay and and but and so that's where the, the where the, the the one in the many the the one being in the many bodies so you know we we may have got this idea, we may have bought the idea that Jesus Christ is God, made man. Well, guess what, folks? So are you. There isn't a person alive, male or female, who isn't God, made man. That's what our name means. Hugh means God in ancient Egyptian or divine. The divine man, the divine woman, the, the God, man, being. This is why Hermes called us human beings. You know, Sai Baba was asked, are you God? He said, yes, I am, but so are you. He said, the only difference is I know it and you don't. <laughs> so wake up, folks. You're God. You can do anything. The only reason why we're limited is we limit ourselves. You know, in this book called The Course of Miracles, I'll just take a wee drink and hand it back, which the author claims was um, dictated to her by Christ. Now, what... Whoever the, the source of that book is, and it's more exciting if it is Christ than if it isn't. You know, we won't get arguing about that one, but because he says something very heretical. In, that, in the Course of Miracles, Jesus Christ said, God did not create this world. God, God didn't create life. God didn't, didn't create you. You created this world. You created this life. You created you. These bodies that are here are your creation. You've made this setup. Well, so have I. We as a collective being 
have actually manifested this reality for our growth and evolution. And in my next talk tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about plasma bodies and explaining spirit in terms of plasma physics, explaining angels as plasma beings. And then you begin to get a real idea because 99.9% .9 of the universe is plasma. And it's much easier to be alive in a plasma body than an atomic body. I mean, you know, physics and spirituality are really merging, but it's physics and plasmality, not spirituality. The word spirit means something with low density. Well, plasma is the lowest density stuff you can get, all right? So you just take out the word spirit, pop in the word plasma, now you've got no problems with physicists. <laughs> simple, simple stuff. we just got to change the language. So it's very exciting to wake up and realize we're God all of us without exception but so is the lowly worm so is the blade of grass and if you think you're almighty because you're God well check this out so is the electron because the electron is a form of energy and in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God energy is God nothing is that is not God everything is God this chair is God. Look, I'm not going to bow down and worship this plastic and plastic chair. I mean, do you see the point? So we've got to change our whole attitude to this and just and just wake up and and we don't need religion. It's almost like when we were when children are little, they need mummy, daddy, God. They need mummy and daddy, and then when they get to teenagers, they rebel, and then they have a party and trash the house. And then they become mummies and daddies in their own right, okay. So, we're now in the teenage phase, okay, we've rejected God, okay, and we've trashed the house, you see, we've trashed the planet, and now we've got to wake up and realise we've got to clean up the mess. We've got to sort it all out, because there ain't no God out there to sort it out, folks. You're it! <laughs> if you don't sort it out, no one's going to sort it out. In other words, it's no good blaming anyone for anything because you're responsible for everything it's so I mean it's so exciting it, it you know waking up to this reality this 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 world is my world that that I, I have manifested with my brothers and sisters because I'm here to learn lessons so what I want to talk a little bit about now is the ascension and also the higher dimensions. I believe that the speed of light is not uniform throughout the universe. I actually, actually believe myself that the speed of light is a feature of a star. And our star happens to emit energy and have planets around it that happens to be 186,000 miles per second. Sorry I'm not into meters but I'm traditional British, British, I like to stick with feet and inches. 186,000 mi miles per second, and that's the speed of the energy in our world. But it could be in other worlds, the speed of energy is different. It could be the speed of energy is faster. Now, that is a prediction, and I believe it's possible to go beyond the speed of light. And what I predict are two laws, I call them the cosmic laws, that govern the relationship between worlds based on physical light and worlds based on super light or super energy. Okay, the first law <coughs> is the law of subsets. All speeds start at zero and go up to their maximum value. So 0 to 30 miles an hour is part of 0 to 60 miles an hour is part of 0 to 100 miles an hour. So this, the worlds based upon slower speeds are part of the worlds based upon faster speeds. So our world is a subset of the next world, which is a subset of the world, next world beyond. And notice that with my hands, this is the world we live in based on the speed of light. That's the world based on twice the speed of light. And actually the next step out is 16 times the speed of light because it's like the Fibonacci series. It's like the, the golden mean. It goes like that. Okay. So 
the thing is that so our world could be part of a greater world of 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 super energy okay you got the first law and the second law is in my physics I show that space and time are a feature of the vortex and the wave they're created by the vortex and created by the wave in other words the passage of time from past present to future is a feature of the unidirection movement of energy energy just goes in one it moves in one direction and that creates that feature of time okay and so there's no space-time separation between these different worlds of energy and super energy because space and time belongs in each world not between the worlds the separation between the worlds is speed so if there are these other worlds they're all around us and interpenetrating our world but we're not aware of them because they're moving too fast or well, the speed of their energy is too fast so that's the second law which is the law of simultaneous existence they're all existing simultaneously okay so the interesting thing about this model that I'm building up if you look at my hands you see concentric spheres and I'm bringing back the theory of the planes I'm a great follower of Hermes because the word Hermes means movement and Hermes said that everything is based on movement and he also spoke about the planes the word planet comes from the word planes that energy is divided into these levels and they're organized in concentric spheres the harmony of the spheres so there is a possibility that there are these other worlds and that they're populated by beings and those beings could see us even if we can't see them <coughs> and they're all around us and our world is part of their world. Have you got it? Great. Well, the traditional description of angels is that they're all around us. And we can't see them because they're moving too fast. And fairies, they're too, we're too slow and clumsy. In other words, in these mythologies, which we're supposed to reject as nonsense, they recognize that the separation between us and the so-called spiritual low-density worlds is a factor of speed okay so if you take crop formations crop formations are really interesting because you know the Doug and Dave nonsense they, those guys were they were the hoaxes and they were paid to claim to be hoaxes they were ex REF ex intelligence personnel paid 50,000 quid each by the British government to claim that they made the crop circles all right so let's put that case to bed so if it wasn't Doug and Dave because they're dead and crop circles are still happening and they appear within you know within too short a space of time for anyone to be responsible for them all and you know even if one crop formation could not be explained by hoaxes then that has to be explained if no all crop circles but one have been created by hoaxes still that one crop circle that we can't explain by hoaxes means the whole thing is open to study and what I'm saying is that just as we paint pictures on canvas so beings paint pictures in our world in crop in the crops to communicate with us in pictures if you're going to talk to a horse what are you going to talk Chinese Swahili Japanese French Italian Nepalese you you built communicate in pictures well, are your crop formations? What? How? Did, how does it happen? Good point. Good point. Well, basically, in the in the world of super energy, it's like a template is superimposed over the field, just like a stencil. Energy is directed into that taint template. It's microwave energy. It's a huge amount of energy over a very very short space of time, and sufficient to cause the nodules to cause the the moisture inside the um, stem to 
turn the stem malleable and then the stem flows according to the template. There's a scientist called Levengood who's done a lot of research on crop formations and uh, it's, it's worth looking into his work because he, he looks at all the scientific material around crop, crop formations. The reason why I'm, I'm pro crop formations and I, I don't believe they're a hoax is because they provide the proof that I'm looking for of those two cosmic laws. In other words, that our world is part of a greater world, there's super intelligence that causes the, the, the crops to form, uh, the, 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 these formations. Now, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that crop formations are caused by aliens or that they're caused by spacemen or they're caused by, you know, little green people. I, I'll be talking about this tomorrow, which is the plasma, plasma beings. And I believe it's the plasma, be, plasma beings. And I'll be talking a little bit about, so I'll come back to the crop formations tomorrow in terms of, of plasma, how we can explain um, you know, crop formations with plasma. And the other thing is orbs. People are seeing a lot of orbs on digital cameras. And again, that's the plasma, plasma phenomena, which you know, they're old words that we use like angels and fairies. And what we've got to do is get it into a scientific understanding. Talk about electromagnetic fields. Uh, but what matters is shape. It's the shape of the wave. It's the shape of the vortex. The intelligence is carried in the shape. And once we get the idea of fields, one field superimposed upon another. Okay. We, and and the, the, the effect of resonance and shapes. We, we can make scientific sense of some of these things that are going on. For example, how do we explain the formation of our bodies? Because every cell comes from an original cell, which has the same genetic information. And a, prof a professor of Yale University, a professor of medicine, a chap called Harold Saxton Burr, did a lot of research in the 1930s and he discovered that all living organisms have electromagnetic fields and he was measuring these fields with high impedance voltmeters and he discovered that it's not what a cell is genetically that determines what it becomes it's where it is what he did is he, he took a, a, a newt morula which is just the, the, the little group of cells before it differentiates. He sliced cells off the presumptive tail end and grafted them onto the head end and sat to see what would happen. Did he get a monster newt with a tail growing out of his head? No, he got a perfectly normal newt. And then what he did is he took another newt morula and he put it in, in a, between two electric plates and reversed the field. And now for the first time in recorded history, a nuke grew up in its egg the wrong way round. So <clears throat> it's not what the cell is, but where it is. And again, the idea is that you have a super energy field overlapping your body, which is allowed by the law of simultaneous existence. And you have information coming from the super energy field in the, into the physical field which is allowed by the law of, of, of subsets where energy runs downhill. So energy and information is coming through from, the, from one field into another, from the, the super energy field into the physical field, which you call your body, <coughs> controlling differentiation. And it's very much the same sort of technology that would be used to create the shape of a, of, of, of a crop circle. It's the same basic physics. The same physics of of resonance, of, of using a, a superimposing a field on a body of matter and getting information, getting frequency information into it. It's the same way that you're creating a crop circle, which the, the chap over there asked about, how do you f create a crop circle? It's exactly the same technology or, or, or science or physics, if you like, as the field. You, you, you need to re read Lynn McTaggart's book on the field or um, uh, the, the, the work of Harold Saxton Burr on the life field. So basically what we're doing is beginning to reinterpret a lot of this, these ancient ideas into modern language. And then, oh yes please.
Thank you very much. I shouldn't be eating sweets in the um, lesson. I know teacher won't approve of this, but seeing as one has been offered to me, I think I'll just keep the sweet until I finish my talk. I shouldn't even eat it. I'm a nutritionist, so I shouldn't be eating sugar. So I'm going to get caught out on YouTube now. So <clears throat> the thing is that I want to just finish my talk. Thank you. We've been showered with sweets here. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of talk about ascension and there's a very exciting idea around and that is the possibility of, of physical, physical immortality, the possibility that we don't have to die, some really wacky ideas, that there's talk about planetary ascension. But I've got this, this idea which I'd like to share with you. What if we could accelerate the speed of the energy in every subatomic vortex beyond the speed of light? Your body would be the same, <coughs> there would be no change in the frequency of vibration because increasing frequency of vibration is how microwaves work, we don't want to cook you. <coughs> but if you, if we change the relativity constant, so it's no longer the speed of light but 16 times the speed of light, then you will find yourself in the super energy reality. In a, 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 you find yourself on a planet or in a, in a, in a body of matter in which the speed of the energy is all based upon 16 times the speed of light. So how is this possible? Well, it's very simple, and that is <coughs> you can superimpose a teleportation beam in super energy <coughs> over a physical body and then switch on the power. And as soon as the physical body is in that field of super physical energy, then by resonance, <coughs> the speed of the energy will accelerate in all the particles and disappear out of space-time. You know, beam me up, Scotty. I mean, it's, it was like it's, a lot of these television programs have been educating us into the possibility. It's like uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you know, Bilbo and Frodo putting on the ring and, and, and vanishing and becoming invisible. Because that's what happened when you change the speed of the energy light no longer reflects off it and it, you no longer interact with it in terms of charge <clears throat> so you don't feel it and you don't see it so it's intangible and invisible so again we've got a physics that is predicting the, uh, the, the ascension at the moment it's just theory but I tell you this if this planet went through ascension and you woke up one morning to find yourself in a different situation in a different world you would need this physics to explain and understand what's going on. So you never know. It's time may come. So thank you very much indeed. Anyone got any questions? A bit what? Yes, do, do. I love, I love that, yes. I, I love the science. Now, if I can repeat that question for the sake of camera. This lady has said, why do we need to explain it all? Well, that's typical of a lady because ladies are a right brain and we blokes are left brain. And women feel things and intuit things. I think the reason we need to explain it is because of the blokes. There are a lot of people on... There are a lot of blokes. There are, oh, they listen to the language. No, they're... they're, 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 they're you know, there are schools that are teaching science, there, there are people out there that if we can make sense of this scientifically, it becomes much more intelligible for humanity. You see, we do have minds. I mean, I was taught to stop the mind and just meditate, you know, and don't listen to your mind and all that sort of stuff. But the trouble is, try to stop listening to your mind. It's <coughs> very difficult. So we need to satisfy the mind. And if the mind isn't satisfied, and also Buddha said that uh, right understanding is part of enlightenment. And look, if we can get the whole thing over and done with, done and dusted inside an hour, because we've only got an hour before this tape runs out, so if we can explain the whole universe in an hour, we've got the rest of our lives to stop thinking about it and just get on with feeling it and experiencing it. Go find the reggae. Yay! Great. Thank you very much. Any more points or questions? Uh, well, what we've got in the book is, I avoid maths like the plague because 
the only equation that's acceptable to general readership is um, E equals MC squared. Uh, for every equation, you lose 75% of your readership. So future generations can develop the math of this, and there are people who are working on the math, but what I'm doing is trying to present this to ordinary people. And, uh, but I've, I've got the book in two sections. I've got the first section, which is the general idea, and the second section, which is basically um, more technical information for, for people who are in, in, in physicists. Okay, any more points? I'm, I'm fascinated by vortices. I can, yes. You see them on every scale. The water down the black hole. Yeah. The galaxies. Yeah. Um, they're everywhere. It seems, it seems to me that it's a very stable organisation of everything. It is very stable. The thing about the... Yeah. The, the thing about the, these vortices, and it's interesting, like elementals are seen by people with uh, psychic abilities as vortices and they hold a presence, they hold a shape, they hold a form, they're like memory. They're very very stable whereas light is very transitory, you know the waveform is come and gone, you, you, you see. So they, 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 these two basic basic forms and vortices are everywhere and um, most of the vortices we're used to are conical vortices or toroidal vortices but it's interesting when we get the spherical vortex which is the ball of wool and um, it's, it, you know, what, what we need to do is look at all the different types of vortices. The spherical vortice, vortex has an axis of spin, but because it's changing all the time, you can't measure it. So it has no poles, not because it doesn't have poles, but because they're changing so quickly, you, you, you're, you're not aware of it. Okay. So I think we'll close down there. Thank you very much for your attention, and have a good day. Thank you. I'm going to eat my sweet now. Debt Free TV, in association with getoutofdebtfree.org.